Welcome back to Zoo 3649. This is lecture 20. We're continuing with population genetics. And we're going to, in this section, we're going to talk to you about three very important models. And they're all null models in a way. And the first one you already learned about, which was the Hardy Weinberg model. And the Hardy Weinberg model is to m measure whether a population is evolving. And so you measure that by looking if the allele frequencies have changed significantly from one time to the next, or observed and expected are significantly different, then you reject the null model of no evolution and you say that evolution is happening. So the right Fisher population is another model like that. And the right Fisher population, uh, together with the neutral theory, which is coming in the next couple of lectures, these are the three big models in population genetics that you're going to learn about in uh, Zoo 3649. And we'll get to more complex models when you're in honors. So why do we have a right Fisher population? What does this model do that Hardy Weinberg doesn't do? So what is a right Fisher population? Well, it's named after two guys, uh, as, you, <laughs> as you can imagine. Both of these guys you've already heard about before. If you've been watching the other lectures, if you've not been other watching the other lectures, I suggest you stop this lecture right now and go and watch the other ones because you're probably going to be quite lost in this lecture if you didn't watch all the other lectures before this one. Because at this point, uh, 3649 gets very hard. And if you're lost, you know why. It's because you didn't watch or if you did watch, you didn't understand the previous lecture. So please, I advise you to go back and watch them before you go any further because it's going to get very hard from now on. Okay, we're talking about models. So now, Hardy Weinberg, as I said to you, is a model for seeing whether evolution is happening or not. But Hardy Weinberg can't do what? Hardy Weinberg cannot tell you what force of evolution is causing the change in allele frequency. It can tell you that evolution is happening, yes, but it cannot tell you which of the four forces is making the allele frequencies change, okay? And that's where the right Fisher population comes in. <clears throat> so a right Fisher population named after Sewell Wright, you see here on the left, the father of genetic drift, and by uh, Ron Fisher, the uh, father of mathematics uh, and evolution. So uh, both these guys thought of this idea at the same time, and that's why it's named after both of them. And as I said, these were uh, Hardy, Weinberg, Wright, Fisher. These were the guys that first tried to put mathematics to biology. And um, that's why they are the ones who developed these cool models. Okay, when we talk about mathematics, we talk about a model. So how do we model what's going on in biology? So this is interesting, right? So the Wright Fisher population is a simple population and it's been idealized, okay? It's been idealized so that we can measure, use it to measure changes in allele frequencies. Remember, we want to measure changes in allele frequency, right? Because that's how we know whether the population is evolving, okay? So let's make the population a simple one, as simple as possible, so we can measure evolution. But there's a big difference between the right Fisher population and Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Because Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, remember, it cannot measure any particular force of evolution. It measures evolution in general. The right Fisher population is designed for a certain force of evolution. Okay, not randomly. Uh, it's not. It's not taking. It's not just giving you. It's not telling you whether the population is evolved or not. It's telling you the population is evolved or not due to a particular force of evolution, and we're going to talk about it now. So why do we need this? This is yet, as I was saying, yet another model to describe and measure evolution. As you know, Wright was the guy who developed who, who developed this model uh, together with Fisher, and to model the effect of which force of evolution, the simplest one to model. Okay, that's why they started with the Wright Fisher population. The simplest force to model is the force of randomness, the force 
of genetic drift. Okay, so the right fissure population was developed to model genetic drift. It was developed to figure out how much does genetic drift change allele frequencies. So remember, it's not like Hardy Weinberg where it was just to figure out whether there's evolution or not. No, the right fissure goes one step further, right? It's wanting to figure out whether it's drift that is causing the evolution. So we need to, what do we need to do? We need to then, we need to describe the model in its most simple terms. So basically, if we only want to measure drift, we need to make the population so that the only force that is able to work on it is drift. Okay, and that is why we ha the right fissure has these properties. Basically, how what are the properties of a right fissure? And when I go through these properties, you'll see what I'm talking about. You'll see that, unlike Hardy Weinberg, right fissure gets rid of all the other forces of evolution, but it keeps genetic drift. Okay, because it wants to see how much is the allele frequency changing from one generation to the next, but only with genetic drift. All the other forces of evolution are gone. Okay? And that's why we idealize it. We idealize the population so that we can measure the allele frequencies and so that we can get rid of all the other forces of evolution. So when I ask you what are the properties of the right fissure population, uh, what makes it ideal, you don't have to memorize. You've got to think, I've got to keep, I've got to get rid of all the forces of evolution and I've got to keep only genetic drift. How do we do that? Well, let's make, let's idealize it first to make calculations simple. Okay. We are dealing with a diploid population. So each individual has two alleles. Okay. Like you and me, the individuals to make things easier. There's no sex. Okay. Because sex adds more genetic drift. So let's, let's get rid of sex. Okay. Sex also adds what? sexual selection let's get rid of sex so there's no sex in this population each individual is both male and female together all right hermaphroditic then um we want to say that there are no overlapping generations like there are with humans you know where you are born but your your mom and dad are still alive and they are bringing you up while you are being born so that generate your mom and dad's generation overlap with your generation to some degree okay but in this hardy uh, in this right fisher population there's no overlap immediately when the new generation uh, 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 is born the old generation dies so the new generation is born the old generation dies at the very same time so the populations never overlap in age okay that's to also to make life a little bit easier for calculations so the other property, another property is that the new individuals are formed each generation by random sampling. In other words, with replacement. In other words, um, if there are X amount of individuals in the population, the ones who are going to make it to the next generation, you close your eyes and you pick at random. Okay? So what? There's no fitness. There's no such thing as all oh, the fittest ones are going to go to the next generation. No. That means there's no selection. There's no fitness, okay? It's random sampling. It's only genetic drift. So the next property is each parent has an equal probability of contributing a gamete to the, an individual that survives to breed in the next generation. So what does that mean again? If each, per, if each parent has the same probability of contributing, so of breeding, it means that there's no... There's no sexual selection. You don't choose your mates, okay? You're made randomly. So there's no sexual selection. So no selection again, only drift, okay? Again, randomly mating individuals, no selection, only drift. No mutation. So now we've gotten rid of selection. We have want no mutation, of course, no new, new mutations in our right fisher population. No migration. So we don't want gene flow either. No migration out, no migration in. And lastly, what do we need for genetic drift to model genetic drift? The last and most important one. Yes, the clever ones have guessed it. The population size is constant. Okay? That means you are modeling drift because you know from your practical 
and from all the things I've told you that proportion s genetic drift is in inversely proportional to the size of the population so if you keep your population size constant then you know you have genetic drift okay and some of you might why are you confused by that why are you confused by that remember what Hardy Weinberg Hardy Weinberg does not control control for genetic drift. Genetic drift is is sorry. Ge uh, genetic drift is uh, also inside Hardy Weinberg, except Hardy Weinberg does not account for genetic drift. So in Hardy Weinberg, what is the population size? It is infinite, right? So there's no genetic drift in the Hardy Weinberg population. But in this population, it's not infinite. It is constant with time. So you see how. That is the most important thing that is different to Hardy Weinberg. This one is constant. That means you got drift. Whereas in Hardy Weinberg, it's infinite, no drift. Okay, so now we want to see, we want to make sure that the only thing happening in our population is genetic drift. And then we want to see how a genetic drift would change our allele frequency. Okay, and on such a population, you will have the genotype and allele frequencies being related to each other in hardy weinberg equilibrium but the only change from one generation to the next will be through genetic drift all right so how can we use this right fisher population to model genetic drift there are a couple of approaches um and uh, these may be questions in tests i can tell you that they um uh, I can't tell you for sure, certain whether there will be questions, but, you know, I always drop hints every now and then that there will be questions. Um, uh, whenever I feel that there is an important thing to remember, I usually ask a question about that in a test or in an exam. So be careful. Be Have your eye, ears open for when uh, I'm giving these hints during the lectures. Okay, so... There are two approaches to modeling genetic drift. There is actually more than two, but we won't deal with too many in, in 3649. We'll save the rest for honors. But the rate at which, say you have two isolated populations, okay? The rate at which, and they, there is no migration between them. The rate at which they become different, and different they will become. That is a fact of life. If there is no migration between them, they will eventually become different to each other. But the rate at which they become different to each other is given by 1 over 2n, okay? That is the rate at which two populations will become drift different to each other. That is the rate of genetic drift, okay? It's 2n because why? We have a diploid population, okay? And divided by n means what? It's inversely proportional, right? If it... if n was at the top so it was n divided by something then genetic drift would be directly proportional but it's not directly proportional to population size it is inversely so there's always one over the population size and it's the population of what the population of alleles so it's not just the individuals you have to multiply the individuals by two for diploids right that's why we have two n and one over because genetic drift is always inversely proportional to the population size Okay, and the other way to model drift is within one population, it is the um, probability of being identical to another randomly sampled individual in the same population. Okay, so it's a measurement of how much homozygosity you have in your population. It's known as the inbreeding coefficient. And that, so the level of homozygosity or the, or the rate of drift increases at 1 over 2n um, and in, in a population, okay? So the probability of being identical to another individual in the population is determined by the size of the population, okay? Smaller the population, more chance of being identical. Bigger the population, s s lesser chance of being identical, okay? And that brings us now to the way we measure genetic drift. Okay, and you know that it is not just the, fa the uh, population size, it is the effective population size. It's the number of individuals that, act individuals that actually breed in the population. Okay, the ones that are, uh, that are randomly sampled to breed. So this is how we measure genetic drift. 
So the actual size of the right fissure population is not the same as the effective size of a right fissure population. Okay, so the effective number, it's always the number that breed. So it's only the size of the breeding population that counts in evolution, okay? O the whole population size doesn't really matter as much as the breeders because only the breeders put their genes to the next generation. Only the breeders are involved in evolving a population, okay? If you don't breed, you're not part, you're, you're, your, your role in evolution stops with you, okay? If you breed, then your role in evolution is, is, is complete because you've passed your genes to the next generation. Okay, so NE then is basically the measurement of genetic drift. It's the way to measure genetic drift, just like fitness is the way to measure what? Natural selection, right? That's right. NE, the effective population size, is a way to measure genetic drift in a right fissure population. So that brings us to our practicals, which we've already started, and we've gone a, a long way, almost halfway through our practicals. So... Needless to say, you know that you will be doing this in practical six to eight. We will be simulating allele frequencies and uh, effective population size. In fact, we're not <coughs> in our in our simulations. We're assuming that n and ne are the same, and we are actually only changing n. Remember when we do did the table for genetic drift? We only change n. So let us assume we have a population. We are looking at one gene. By, by the way, this lecture is actually going to be very helpful to you uh, in uh, writing assignment two. So uh, when you're doing assignment two, just a hint, please come back to this lecture, watch it again, so that you can get more ideas. If you weren't quick enough to write all the things down I was telling you during the practical, here's your second chance. This lecture is for you. So we're looking at one gene in the genome. Okay, we have a population, one gene, two alleles, so diallelic or biallelic. Um, and the dominant allele big A, frequency is P, recessive allele small a, frequency is Q, and what, what will we have uh, in a situation where genetic drift, if we change the population size, okay, so we have a large number of breeders, okay, we have a large number of breeders, and we, ha so, sorry, 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 let's, let's, let's start again. We have two populations here. This population on the left and this population on the right. You can see my mouse moving along the cursor there, right? So in this population, quite a few individuals successfully breed, okay? Quite a few individuals successfully breed, okay? It's supposed to be an S here, okay? So successfully breed, the S got chopped off. So quite a few individuals successfully breed. And so the ones, the effective size, this is the effective N E. You see that's N there, and this is N E. These are the only the breeders. Okay. Notice in this uh, number of breeders is quite a few, and the allele frequency of the breeders, only the N E, the uh, allele frequency of of the effective population is actually less than the original population. So what frequency is this population going to have in the second generation? If only these individuals with this allele frequency breed, then the next generation will have the allele frequency of the breeders, not the allele frequency of the original population. Obvious, right? Because only the breeders put their genes to the next generation. Now, what about this population on the right? Here in this population, you also have a big population to start with, with the same allele frequency, 0 0.25, the same as the population on the left. But what happens to this population here on the right? This population, the NE is much smaller. Look, only a few individuals, only five individuals breed. Here, 10 individuals breed, double. So the NE of this population on the right is actually very small. So the allele frequency of these effective breeders is only 0 0.1. Okay, so what is the going to be the allele frequency in the next generation? It is also going to be 0 0.1 because the allele frequency in the second generation cannot be more than the allele frequency of the effective number of breeders, the effective size, which is this, these, only these five breeders here are the, is the effective population. So you see how if you s change NE, if we change the effective population size, which we've done here in this one, it's 10 and in this one it's 5. You see how if you you can change allele frequency if your an NE is changing but if it's a change with 
a big number, you see how it, it leaves frequency? It changes, but it, the change is not too big. It's a small change. But here, if you reduce any really to a small number, you can see how quickly allele frequency changes, and it changes by a lot compared to the original allele frequency. Okay, and that's what happens when you change population size. Genetic drift gets stronger. It gets stronger, fewer effective breeders, and the allele frequency changes much more in the next generation because genetic drift is stronger because it's population size is small. So what would you predict if, what would happen to the allele frequency uh, of big A if we increase population size? Okay, you've seen these graphs before. You've seen them, in fact, just the other day. We have here uh, allele frequency uh, of the big a allele. We started at 0 0.5 and we do how many? One, two, three, four, five, six different, n is equal to six different loci here. And we're simulating six loci and we're seeing what genetic drift does to the allele frequency. And in, let's see, five of these, five out of six, the uh, P has gone to fixation in one, two, three of the simulations. And in two, this simulation here and that simulation here, Q has become fixed. So A, big, a small A has become fixed. Okay, so in these populations, one, two, and three, there's only big A, and in these two populations, uh, there's only small A. And this yellow population, you see, it's not gone to the top or bottom, so still this population has both big A and small A in it. You see, though, when a population size is small, that more alleles go to fixation. Now, if you look at the population size, we make the population size bigger, you see of the six simulations, only one, two, three are going to and where uh, are going to fixation, whereas these three still have both alleles in the population. You've done this, you've made a nice table of it in your practical. Okay, increase the size even more, you get even more loci. After many generations, you find that there's still big A and small A in the population. Okay, so the bigger the population size, the more harder it is for genetic drift to get rid of one of the alleles. The smaller the size, genetic drift is very strong. It can easily get rid of one of the alleles completely. Okay, so what about natural selection? You will also be doing this in, in, in um, the practicals. We've also started doing them in the practicals. Uh, you will, we will simulate uh, Alleles, uh, alleles, uh, uh, different fitnesses on the on different the three different genotypes in a diallelic system. Okay, same situation. One population, one gene in the genome, two alleles, big A and small A. So what would we happen? What would happen if if we had um, a situation where the two homozygotes had a higher fitness than the heterozygotes? So what kind of selection would we have? In that one where there's selection against the heterozygotes as you guessed it and you know this from your practicals depending on where you start excuse me sorry I will just bring that back so you can see your my mouse depending on your starting frequency you can either go to complete fixation of the big a allele so when Q becomes one or if you start below 0 0.5 you can have the complete fixation of the small a allele that means p becomes one where here where q become is zero p is one so you've got complete fixation here of the small allele so you see when you select against the homozygote uh, the heterozygotes you select for either of the heterozygotes sorry if you select um for one of the homozygotes it's what we call directional selection and you actually selecting uh for the allele frequencies to be pushed in a certain direction, either towards the one allele, big A, or towards the other allele, small A. So that's directional selection, where you have selection of the homozygotes high and the heterozygotes low. But what happens with the opposite? What happens when you have uh, selection for the heterozygotes? This is the famous case of selection, heterozygous advantage, heterosis, whatever you want to call it. I like calling it balancing selection. Okay, and balancing selection is when the heterozygote has the highest fitness. And what happens in balancing selection? I told you it is the only selection where you get what? Where you get genetic diversity being maintained by natural selection. In all other kinds of selection, 
genetic diversity is being lost. The fittest allele or the fittest genotype is being selected, okay, normally. But in balancing selection, the heterozygote is being selected. That means both big A and small A will always be in the next generation. Because why? The heterozygotes have the ultimate advantage. So you cannot lose, you cannot lose big A or small A from the population under balancing selection. So you see, no matter where you start uh, under balancing selection, you will always get the allele frequency reaching a stable equilibrium around about 0 0.5. If you start at low, it doesn't matter where you start it, you will all approach a stable equilibrium. That is balancing selection. And this equilibrium is telling you what? It's at 0 0.5 and it's telling you all the populations are, have both big A and small a in it. No population has lost big A or small a, thanks to balancing selection. So what would happen if the allele frequency uh, of the recessive allele, the allele of the, the recessive allele, small a, was lethal in the homozygote configuration? So if you had small a, small a, you know again what kind of selection this is. This is selection against the homozygous recessive genotype. So in other words, it's against the lethal condition because in this situation, small a, small a gives you a lethal condition. You, you die or your fitness is not very high. And so that means that what, what kind of fitness is this? This is, this is purifying selection, right? Where the, where the selection is against the small allele, but it's against the uh, homozygous recessive, but it's trying to purify the population of small a, because small a is the one where it comes together in the homozygote causes a lethal problem. But in this, remember in this um, selection, both the dominant and the carrier, the heterozygote, have a high fitness, or have the same high fitness, okay? So what does that mean? It means that no matter where you start, the allele frequency of big A, P. No matter what, even if you start very low, it will rise to, and small A will become smaller and smaller and smaller in every single one of these populations. And it will approach one, okay? But it will never get to one. And we've already been through this. Why will it never get to one? Because remember, the heterozygote is still carrying one small a, and the heterozygote fitness is one, right? And so the heterozygote is always going to keep the small a allele in the population, which is why P can go very high, almost reaching one, almost reaching one, almost reaching one, but it never reaches one, okay? Because the population is trying to purify itself of small a, but it can never do it. Why? Because the homozygotes keep it alive in the population. Small a hides behind the homozygous and so the homozygous always brings it to the next generation that's why it p never goes to one it tries but it can never do it okay i want to end the lecture here by just uh, summarizing um the um the four forces of evolution and what they do to allele frequencies and this is a beautiful little uh, diagram and i suggest all of you Look at this in the PDF form that you have with nice colors and see how the forces of evolution work. Because this diagram summarizes it beautifully. In fact, you don't need to memorize them when you look at this diagram and you understand. So we're going to go through a little bit slowly, okay? And please, be feel free to stop, rewind, go back 30 seconds, go back uh, five minutes, listen again listen again listen again on the video you know i can explain it a thousand times to you because why you can always go back and listen again okay so the first situation here so on let let me start by saying these boxes here uh you see on the where my mouse is on the left hand side of your screen these boxes here right they are uh, a set of populations and on the right is an, a box, another set of populations after a force of evolution has worked on them. Okay? And each, so we start with this one and we go to that one. Okay? And we start with this one, we go to that one, we start with this one, we go to that one, and so on. Okay? And so each box change is one force of evolution. So now let's see. 
let's see what happens in the top situation. The top box, you have the ancestral population here on the, so the or the parents population, if you like, on the right on the left and the later population of the uh, next generation on the right here. So let's see what happens when there's no evolution. When the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Remember Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium means there's no evolution. Look, if you count each of the colors of the balls here and graph them, you will find that the red ball it has is the most, uh, the blue or dark blue, purple is the least, uh, light blue is the second and so on if you count all of these say these alleles okay and then these this graph here is what it's the allele frequency spectrum okay remember that word guys especially next year in honors if you want to do masters you will need to know what the allele frequency spectrum of a population looks like okay so this here graph here is the allele frequency spectrum of what this population here because why if you count all the colors and graph them you will get these this graph okay because that's red is most blue is second most pink then pink then green then uh, purple and yellow orange are the same low frequency okay red is high frequency what happens when there's no evolution you have generations of random mating no migration no genetic drift no mutation no natural selection what happens nothing happens what happens to the allele frequency spectrum? Nothing happens to it. It remains identical to the parental or ancestral population. You see this population? If you count all the colors, you will get the same graph. Okay? So no evolution has happened in this population because why the allele frequencies have not changed from one generation to the next. That population is in hardy weinberg equilibrium. It, there's no evolution happening there. Okay? So now let's go to the next box. That is the situation where you have only drift. This is a what you can call a right fisher population when there's only drift happening. Okay, so here's your population. Here's the starting allele frequencies. Okay, what happens after imperfect sampling? Okay, some alleles are underrepresented just to, due to random chance. What happens? What happens? We have you see the allele frequency spectrum at after drift and before drift. What has happened to that population? We've lost. Who have we lost? The allele frequency spectrum does not lie. It tells us that we've lost who? This guy here. We've lost the purple allele. It is not. The effective breeders did not have purple. And therefore, in the next generation, there's no purple. Okay? So that we genetic drift have has reduced the diversity. Now we had six alleles before, now we have five. Genetic drift always reduces the diversity. Okay, so now what happens here on the, in the third box? This is natural selection. Now in natural selection, let's start with a population where all we have three alleles and all three are at equal frequency. So if you count the red, purple, and green, they are exactly the same number. So the graph here shows you that all three of them are, have, have an equal frequency. Okay, then after the environment factors are unfavorable for who? For red, okay? So red has a low fitness in this world, okay? So in this world, red has a low fitness. What is going to happen to red in the next generation? Not so many red are going to make it to the next generation, right? So what, what, what's going to happen? You're going to lose the red allele from the population. Look in the next generation. What has happened to red? The frequency of red has gone what? Down. The frequency of the other two have gone up. That is tell That is what happens with natural selection. Okay, against one allele, okay, it brings the genetic diversity down. Okay, sometimes it's only one allele that's favored, in which case they will only one allele will be favored and both of them will be down. It depends how many alleles natural selection is favoring, in which if it's favoring f going for the allele, or is the fitness high for that allele or for those two alleles, or is the fitness low. If your fitness is low, you will see fewer of those alleles in the next generation. Okay, so this is where selection is reducing diversity. Remember I told you the balancing selection keeps two alleles, okay? And that's why balancing selection does not reduce diversity because you always have two alleles in the population. Now, what about migration? This is an easy one, right? Gene flow. Let's start again with three equally frequent alleles, red, uh, green, and purple. And if you have gene flow coming in, one uh, with... Uh, new alleles entering the population 
you have a new allele into the population and what has happened you've increased the variation in this situation because why suddenly from outside the population came this orange allele and now you have orange allele in the population it could also have been what that you could have um, had all the green alleles leaving the population right in which case you would have uh, no orange and no green you would only have um, uh, red and purple okay so gene flow depending if it's a new allele is coming in it increases the variation but if a only alleles are going out, it can reduce the variation. So gene flow can do both, okay? Reduce and increase. And lastly, mutation, uh, well, mutation basically creates new alleles, right? It's the main, it's the main way to create variation, as you know from 2544. So mutation means, so you have an e uh, three alleles in the population. What happens? A red allele becomes, and uh, mutates into an orange allele. Okay, and so you have this orange allele here, and what happens to your allele frequency? Red goes down slightly, and orange comes up slightly. So your mutation has changed the allele frequency of this population. So for these four forces, drift, selection, gene flow, and mutation, in every situation, the allele frequency before is not the same as the allele frequency spectrum after. So in other words, the, this force has evolution has changed the allele frequency of that population okay so you see with this one diagram how all the forces of evolution are clear what they are doing to variation is clear what happens to allele frequencies is clear you don't need to memorize these things guys we'll see you in the next lecture about f statistics